Thank you so much for joining us today. It's Monday. I love Mondays because they never go right. <laughs> I got a right guess for you. I've got Dr. Alexis Abramson. She's going to talk about Medicare Part D. You know, it's time for people to make their decision, and I know there's a lot of new people coming into the system. So she's going to maybe give us a little bit of clarity on what to do and when to do it. Dr. Abramson, welcome to the Valdir Beebe Show for the first time. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's my pleasure. Tell me, what, you know, there's A, B, I think there's a C, and I know there's a D. What is Medicare Part D? So Medicare Part D is basically the pharmacy side, the prescription side of Medicare, and it's the coverage for you that will cover all of your prescriptions, your medications throughout the year. Do you automatically get Medicare Part D, or do how do you get, uh, I, I guess, you can go into the Medicare system, I guess, when you turn 65, you correct me when I'm wrong, but do you automatically get Part D, or is it an elective or an optional? How do you get Part so D? So that is such a great question, and actually, I wanted to share some tips with you, because that's the number one question I'm asked. Do you automatically get it? And the answer is absolutely not. But you automatically should enroll in Medicare Part D, whether you are on a prescription or not, because the short-term costs are really, really limited as compared to the long-term value of something like this. So if I can, I'd love to give three tips that I think would be great for, for people to understand about Medicare Part D, because I know it's such sort of Medicare is a maze and it can be very overwhelming. I think oh. the first, you know, the first tip, Valder, that I would say is number one, yes, enroll. Go on Medicare.gov and make sure that you understand more about Medicare and understand more to, about the Part D program. Or you can call their 800 number, which is 800-633-4227. And that's just, you know, the government's website, Medicare, that'll give you all the information. And then the second tip I would get that, give that I think is really, really super important is to make sure that you research your plans because there's tons of different plans out there. And no matter where you live, ge you know, from a ge geographic standpoint or perhaps the type of medication you take, you're going to possibly have a completely different plan that you would use. So research is super important. And then the third tip that I would get, give you is that when you do go on and you do research, you go to a website that's similar to sort of like a plan file. Finder. So, for instance, the, uh, the Humana Walmart Preferred Rx plan, if you go on their website, you can actually enter what your zip code is and enter the kind of prescriptions that you use. And that way, you can automatically find out what the costs are going to be, whether they carry your prescription, and all kinds of different information about Part D. And um, just that website is walmart.com backslash Rx plan, and you can find out so much information. That's great information. Let me ask you, do, do you roll, enroll in Medicare when you turn 65 or when you retire? When do you enroll in it? Because we really don't know, Dr. Abramson. It's so confusing. So you, can't, you are automatically eligible at 65 for Medicare, or if you are disabled and under 65, you can find out if you're eligible for Medicare. But the things that are very, very important for, for, for people to understand is that it's not like you wake up and you're 65 and boom, you've got a Medicare plan. You've got to, go, you know, you have, you've got to do the work. I hate to tell you, for health insurance, you've got to do the work. Even if you're 65 plus, you have to make sure you do. And that's why it's really, really important to make sure that you understand that, you know, things like Social Security, things like Medicare, all of these wonderful benefits that we have, that mature adults have, um, they take a little bit of research planning, and it's really important to make sure that you have a plan that fits you. When we turn the first of the year 2013, will the Medicare plan of 2012 change in 2013? It does change. It changes slightly. There's some very interesting changes, some of which are that there'll be alcohol uh, counseling, there's depression counseling, there's some preventative changes that are happening, but also uh, that, that big thing that we call the donut gap, you know, the, the donut hole, the coverage gap, that's going to change a little bit too and will progressively change over the years. But I really, really would say the best thing to do that is that individuals go out and do their research to see those changes because there's they're listed very prominently online and then very prominently you know in terms of calling um, the Medicare phone number that I, I have I, I to ask you one more question I, this is really important the Affordable Health Care Act 
does it intersect with Medicare? Because, you know, we really don't understand this stuff. Yeah, you know, and I've been in the field forever, and I, I'm just trying to understand it as well. Um, you know, I'm not a policy person necessarily, but what I understand about it is is that going forward, they certainly are prioritizing mature adults because mature adults, if you think about it, 10,000 people are turning 65 every day, one every eight seconds. That's so, my audience. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you've, so you know for sure, Valder, that it's somewhere in Included in there, but I think as time progresses and we understand more about it, we'll see where Medicare does fit in. Well, Dr. Alexa Abramson, you have given us a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> and I failed to mention that my audience is made up of 89.4% women. And of those women, 74% are baby boomers, I've been told. Oh, and that's wonderful. And I tell you what, you make sure that those baby boomers who are caregivers also understand that, that, that places like the, you know, Humana Walmart, RX preferred plan is a place to go, but that their aging loved one might not opt in themselves. So the caregivers and the baby boomers need to make sure that their aging loved ones are opting in. And finally, where's the website you want to send my audience? Because, you know, we're web people now. Oh, that's perfect. I'd love to send them to walmart.com backslash rxplan. Well, Dr. Alexa Abramson, I really appreciate you talking about Medicare Part D and all those other great things that can help us have a better life. Absolutely, and thanks for your time. Thanks so much for staying with us through the break. Today, my guest on the Valder BB Show is Ben Minkowitz. He's going to talk about Sci-Fi's newest competition series, Hot Set. This is on the Sci-Fi channel. Ben Minkowitz, welcome to the Valder BB Show. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Tell me about <laughs> this competition on the, uh, uh, about the Hot Set. Uh, it's a series. It is a series. Are you struggling with saying Hot Set? Are you trying to be careful when you say Hot Set? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> the uh, uh, the show, uh, which uh, premieres at uh, 10 o'clock uh, next Tuesday, following uh, uh, Sci-Fi's other really big hit show that sort of peels back the curtain, lets us take a look inside movie making, that's Face Off. Um, this is a, a competition show, an honest competition show, between two production designers to build uh, a set in three days for just $15,000 with a specific inspiration item, and a specific set of ground rules from a specific script that we give them. Uh, the first episode, they'll see a stranded astronaut on an unknown planet. They have to design that planet, design the circumstances of how the astronaut got there, how did he crash, what were his, what's his situation there. And they, from that point on, they can do whatever they want as long as they meet that criteria. And they have to do it all, again, in just three days and for only $15,000. It is a very, very short period of time and limited money to build something that we will then film. We will then film their scene, and you'll see it on the show. You know, I'm so used to seeing you, and I'm, see and, and I'm visualizing you now here on the Turner Classic movie set. <laughs> that's where I know you from. Yes, that's where, <laughs> I, that's where, that's where most people know me from. This is, a, I, this is a different thing, but it's so related. You know, I, I, one of the reasons why I was so pleased to do this show is that, you know, Turner Classic Movies has afforded me this incredible opportunity to get exposed to these wonderful movies that we've been making in this country and around the world really for the last hundred years. And but here, this is a different level. This is a real insight into the value uh, uh, in seeing, excuse me, uh, how these movies uh, are made. You think you know. I've been on sets. I think I know. Until you see these people, regular craftsmen, artists, make something for a movie, build an entire world in just three days for fifteen thousand dollars, it'll go back and make you. It'll, it'll make your appreciation of all those wonderful films that we show on Turner Classic Movies even better, which I didn't know was possible. Being a viewer has really evolved, and I think you understand that. You know, from just going to the movies on movie night to watching TV, so many hours of TV. Is it because we want to know more that hot set and shows like this have now emerged? 
Yeah, I think so. I think we want to know more. We don't want to spoil the fun. And the great thing about this show, I, I don't think it does either. I think it, it just will enhance your appreciation of the artistry of what you see on screen. Uh, one thing that this show did that really changed the way I think about movies is I'm definitely, a, a, my, when I like a movie, it's almost always because it has a good script, good story, good story development, good character development. That's really what I look for. I don't, I don't care how many helicopters blow up. That's never been a thing that particularly interests me because I'm not a 15-year-old boy. <laughs> but uh, here, I, I now realize that to make a great movie, I'm, I'll still stick with the script. I guess you need four things. You need a screenwriter, you need a director, you need a cinematographer, and you need a production designer. A production designer can save almost everything on a movie if he or she has built, conceived, constructed the right idea for how that film should look. I mean, every great director has a great production designer. That's why their credits are so high up on a film. Oh, I didn't know that. That's something I've learned. See? Yeah. All right, good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you come from a rich history of knowing about movies from your, aunt, your uncle, who was an Oscar winner writer, to, you know, your cousin who wrote and directed credits for Superman 1 and 2, James Bond movie. Yeah. How does it feel to be encapsulated in that kind of world? Well, I mean, it feels great. I'm very proud of my family. My grandfather wrote uh, Citizen Kane. You mentioned my, my Uncle Joe, his brother, who wrote and directed All About Eve, Letter to Three Wives. Uh, you know, Barefoot Contessa, he, uh, Cleopatra. He won four Oscars in uh, in two years, writing and directing back-to-back -back years. I don't think that'll ever happen again. I grew up around politics. Uh, my father moved uh, his part of the family to Washington, D.C., and that's where I grew up. So I, I, I knew that my family had had a significant contribution to movies, but it wasn't really until I moved out here to Hollywood, or visited Hollywood, excuse me, the first couple times that I that I recognized sort of how important the contributions my family was, how important my family was to so many people who cared about movies. Uh, and that's nice. I'm proud of them. I mean, I still love, you know, as far as I'm concerned in, in life, there's there's movies, there's politics, there's baseball, and there, there's not a lot else. Girls, I'm sorry. Oh, there are four, four things. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say there's love. There's love. <laughs> there's okay. love. That's right. Tell me about where can we, where and when. Well, we know we watch it on the Sci-Fi Channel. When do we watch Hot Set? Uh, Hot Set premieres uh, Tuesday uh, at ten o'clock, right after uh, uh, right after the most recent uh, episode of uh, of Face Off on Sci-Fi. Well, Ben Mankiewicz, thank you so much for giving us this insider's view, and we will be tuning in, if yeah. nothing else, but to watch you. <laughs> no, 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 great show, thrilling show. You'll love it. Thank you for saying that. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much for joining us. You guys are in Las Vegas this morning, aren't you? That's yes, right. We have we a are. little um, champagne breakfast out yep. here. All right. Well, you guys are live on the Bowder BB Show coming from Dallas, Texas. Thank you so very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you guys, what do you have, a new show? You guys are just world famous. What are you doing in Las Vegas? I think that's your kind of home. Yeah, that's kind of our, our epicenter. You know, there's uh, the theaters here are so massive that we're able to do things here that we can't do anywhere else. You know, We've always had great uh, fan response when we go to Dallas, but the show here, we turn the entire theater into the inside of a human brain, and then the Blue Men play that brain. They play around with giant iPads, and they play around. In the, in the casino itself, we have our great musicians and the Blue Men and, and a robot go around and kind of dance around in the casino before the show starts as a warm-up. And then uh, when the show starts, the sun rises and we let it rip and we have drums that make smoke rings and we have neuron drums and uh, robot assembly line robots that the Blue Men play music with and lots of luminescent crazy stuff. So we're really excited about this show could only happen in Las Vegas. And it's at the Monte Carlo uh, Resort and uh, Hotel and Casino, which is really important because we got a little room service in yeah, this well, morning. They're really great at that they at Monte Carlo. They have a great Carlo. dish called Apple Cordon Bleu, yeah. which we're having here now. We, we yeah. thought we would wait till. Uh, you know, it's you very can... early here. We had to roll out of bed well, and uh, get a to the studio, on that one. I might need so a... I'm a little, a little careful, hungry. Careful, yeah, okay. Apple is a great way to start the day. 
Did you have another um, question, Valder? I know that we, well, we, we have long yeah. answers. Well, that's okay. I said okay. Oh, you gotta go fast. There's no coming up. Go ahead. Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. We can hear you, Valder. Go ahead. All right. It's a really good point you were making. I'm not sure I heard it, but that was a really good point about how the show ends with a huge celebration. You've seen it before. <laughs> I've seen you guys at FNU here in Dallas. <laughs> you guys are really, really popular here in Dallas. So I'm thinking you're going to be just as popular or more there at the casino, correct? Yeah, I mean, Vegas is kind of a perfect place for Blue Man. It's such a crazy place here. And the Blue Man just fits right in. And, and like I said, the show we have here is one we couldn't do anywhere else. So we're really excited about it. Well, you guys are kind of almost, and this is just not a comparison, so don't take this in, but you guys have elevated to this, this head disallay level where, you know, people just flock to see you. What's so unique about Blue Man Group? Tell me somebody. Well, we haven't figured it out ourselves, but the one thing we'll say is that it seems like people of all different ages and all different tastes can enjoy the show. We have a lot of humor and a lot of drums in the show, and we do notice that every culture around the world, no matter what your taste is, you know, people like humor and they like the beat and the rhythm. And so we really push those two things. Plus, in, in, in recent years, we've really pushed the technology and the kind of the beautiful design and so that people can... And if you're going to put your good money down for a night out, we want you to escape to an entirely new world. And so that's what we've done here is we've created kind of a world that you can go into. There's a part of the show where we turn the entire theater into a human brain and the blue men play neuron drums and it makes the, the lights shoot all around just like this experience here. We're sort of doing an interpretive dance of what it feels like to be in the audience. I'm really enjoying this. Well, did you guys study, like you said, interpretive dance, did you study dance and music in college, or did this, was this something that just evolved? Tell me how no, you we, uh, I, I, I was music. actually, uh, I was actually a, a, a rocket science, and, and Chris was a, uh, a neurologist, physicist, right? Yeah, yeah, neurologist, yeah, physicist, yeah, physicist, neurologist, really. physicist, I studied, geologist. I, I studied history, and, and, mostly uh, math. No, uh, we, we, we both had uh, backgrounds in performance, and uh, Chris more in music than, and drumming than, than I, but... Uh, but we, we did, had, we, did we, we were kind of in a bad situation when we got out of college because we had so many interests that, that didn't go together. We liked science, comedy, art, theater. Mimosas. Uh, food <laughs> and uh, acrobatics and, and vaudeville. And so instead of creating a show with a narrative, we went back 100 years to the vaudeville tradition where people did do those sort of mashups and, uh, and they were able to put... You know, an opera singer with a juggler, with a comedian, with, a, you know, a dog talent show. And so what we've done is we've combined all our interests into a single show. So it's a very selfish way for us to have a job. Okay, tell me really quick, how do you want people to find out more about the show? Send them somewhere? Oh, they can go to blueman.com. Well, actually, the best way to find out about the show is to just get on a plane, come to Las Vegas. That's right. Walk around until you see a blue man and then follow him. <laughs> well, and thank you guys for being on the Valder BB show. I really, really like you guys because you guys are the epitome of what people always say racially. This is what they say. Well, I don't care if they're black, white, or blue. And I don't know if you know that. Oh, well, that's There you cool. go. I love it. All right. But that's, that's, that, right. that's kind of the spirit of the show, for real. Thank you, Chris Wink, and thank you, Phil Stanton of the Blue Man Group, for being on the Valder BB show. Thank nice you, Valder. Valder.